I was just feeling, I call it a cookie cutter, <laughs> you know, happy go lucky ice cream, apple pie, Mormonism, <laughs> where you just mm -hmm. do what you're told and you'd live a normal life and you just follow the prophet. Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 65, Mormon Wept, part three with my guest, Mike Collier. I'm Mark Kane. Today, you can do one of two things. Enjoy some satisfaction that you would never be so gullible to continue down a path so fraught with warning signs. Or you might have empathy and recognize the absolutely powerful grip a belief system can press upon someone, even on a very diligent student. Scripture both warns about judgment and yet demands us to seek truth and discern right from wrong. Here's how I reconcile these two aspects of judgment. And it's not an explicit scriptural teaching. It's implication. You might call it spec... You might call it spec... Speculation. Ha! <laughs> but regardless you might appreciate this brief reflection on why there are cautions. Like Matthew 7, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That kind of caution. In hearing other people's stories, there's the temptation to look down our nose and judge their mistakes, their missed opportunities, their short-sightedness. We do that because our own faults are a little less noticeable when we are busily judging others. This kind of judgment is a way to exalt ourselves, to savor the feeling of being above others, of being more correct, of being better, of being the greatest. That's a misuse of judgment. Now, good and appropriate judgment is what I usually refer to as discernment. It's recognizing the truth in a situation, not for the pleasant feeling it provides, but because what is good matters to you. Because you seek to walk in the ways of your Messiah. There's no prideful rush when you practice that kind of judgment, that discernment, in order to walk humbly with your God. I had moments during this interview where I found myself drawn to this tempting mindset. Like, really, Mike? Uh, I would have seen that for what it... <sighs> I see it in myself. I can feel the selfish pull. And honestly, I can recognize the capacity for all sorts of horrors within myself. Spite, revenge, hatred, harm. I do not occupy the high ground upon which I can stand and point at Mike. I could have been Mike. After the interview, I've got a bit of exciting news about some designs taking place for future regional UCA conferences. Let's pick back up with Mike Collier. If you missed parts 1 and 2, episodes 63 and 64, this will not be nearly as interesting. Now, a 28-second recap. Raised in a fundamentalist sect of the Latter-day Saints and eventually living in a commune, Mike's life took a turn south, like fleeing the country into Central America south. The stresses of living in fear of the U.S. government, of a marriage that crumbled, and the disillusionment of a kingdom commune hope all led Mike into letting off the gas pedal and into a more normal Mormon life. We left off with your departure from the fundamentalist movement and into the mainstream. I want to hear about what your life was like during that period of time. Well, I mean, it was kind of good in a way. I mean, it, it seemed good and it felt good. Hmm. I kind of like was able to lay aside all these doctrinal concerns. And as I did that, 
my personality began to change a little bit to where I wasn't so confrontational, <laughs> which was the way <laughs> I was raised. Yeah. And I began to kind of become a little bit apathetic <laughs> mm. because I just started to accept everything that I was told and not questioned and just go along and <laughs> life is good, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you think some of that was reactionary like when you realized you could just let some of this tension go you kind of just went all in like okay good i'm gonna have me some peace yes absolutely i mean i could see that it was all the doctrinal controversial stuff they kind of caused problems for me in a way you know i wanted to be a little bit normal <laughs> and <laughs> not worry about these things you know yeah you just follow the prophet and then you'll be happy then hmm. you pay your tithing and <laughs> And then that's pretty simple compared to what life was like before, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it seemed like a lot of freedom that you had. Yeah. I could see the appeal of that. I mean, living in a building with people who were unhappy, trying to manage this day and night. I mean, what you experienced in the LDS mainstream had to feel like a glass of fresh water on a parched <laughs> desert. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> did. Um and, you know, I found a beautiful wife, and we got married. We were mainstream. Mm. So all my past was seen behind me. How many years were you part of the LDS Church before you started to churn on some of these topics again? Because we know that's not where you're at now. Yeah, it was probably close to like eight years when I kind of woke up from the, you know, Mormon dream, you might say. <laughs> I mean, I kind of started to fill a void, and I, I missed the deeper thinking of my past, you know? Mm. Deeper doctrine and really looking into truth, you know? Yeah. I kind of felt like if you just do what you're told and just float along, it feels so so average, <laughs> you might say, so <laughs> cliche, you know? Yeah. Okay. When you join the LDS Church, though, you have to wait like a year in order to be temple ready. Temple ready. Yeah. In other words, since I had met my wife, we ended up getting married three months after I met her. And I was probably baptized like a two or three weeks after I met her. But after you're baptized, you have to wait a year minimum. And so you have to have interviews and be faithful and pay tithing. Then you can get a temple recommend, which is basically a little laminated card that has your name. And you show that card when you enter the temple to the patron. Hmm. And then you are able to be admitted. Oh. And the word temple in this case means what? In the LDS faith, they believe that they have temples kind of like biblical temples. And they believe that's part of the restoration. Hmm. 1830 was supposed to be the beginning of the Restoration, and by 1836, he dedicated the first LDS temple, the Kirtland Temple. Kirtland, Ohio. That's oh, by you. That's just down the road. Down the road. And actually, it's still standing. The Nauvoo Temple, um, which is in Nauvoo, Illinois, it was burned down, but it has been rebuilt 10 or 15 years ago. The Nauvoo time period was between 18... 39 was the very beginning of it, and it basically ended in 1845 when the LDS people left Nauvoo and started their trek across the plains to Utah. The next temple that was built was the Salt Lake Temple, and that was a 40-year project. Uh, it was built with granite. They had to have a railway built from the mountains here where there's a granite mine, and they hauled these massive stones by boxcar <laughs> wow. and it was not finished or completed and dedicated until 1890 and i think it was began like 1856 but after 10 years of working on the original temple they they basically started over because they were using limestone as their foundation stones and the, i guess there was a crack and so they started over they removed the limestone and they put granite <laughs> wow so it was a massive undertaking yeah Ugh. But anyway, so they, they built more and more temples, and by 1980-ish, when I was a kid, they had like 40 temples, and now they have like 200 temples. 
in Mormon beliefs, you know, you can have many temples. And the purpose of those temples is different. That's where we do ceilings. That's where they do work for the dead, like baptism for the dead. But anyway, so, you know, a year later, we went through the temple. Mm. We were sealed. So when you go through the temple the first time, you go through for yourself. But regular temple attendance is encouraged for everyone. My mother-in-law has gone, well, she's a temple worker, so she's literally spent thousands and thousands of hours in the temple. She's gone through, they call it a session. Before they do the sealing, you have to have the endowment session. The endowment session is where you make covenants. And you used to make like, they would reveal to you tokens, which were handshakes. They were pretty much identical to different masonry handshakes. Hmm. And that's because Joseph Smith said that, and most Mormons are not aware of this today either, but that Freemasonry in America, you know, like the founding fathers were a lot of them Masons. Yeah. You know, this originally, supposedly, was part of the original priesthood handed down from Christ to his disciples and, you know. Uh, but so they basically say that Freemasonry is kind of a, a an apostate early Christianity. And so now we need to restore that. And so uh, Joseph Smith adopted this right after he was kind of getting involved in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo period. Yeah. So the Freemasons practices, according to this idea, were kind of, um, hold on, hold on. I know the word, appropriated from real supposed Christian practices. If you were going to Freemasonry at the time— they would say that they had the true practices, traditions that they carried on from the days of Solomon. Mm. But that's what the Masons would claim. Based on that, this obviously would have been known by Christ and Christians, and therefore this truth would have been carried on during the Christian era, right? And since it was lost and gone into apostasy and kind of not, not pure, now it needs to be restored. <laughs> and there it was, restored by the Mormon church. And the Mormon faith, they believe that the gospel ordinances— and principles have always been the same since the days of Adam. Adam was baptized. Adam received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Adam um, received his endowment. <laughs> hmm. And so, you know, this was carried on, except for when Moses came along, then they were cursed with like a lower law. And we'll get into that later. But anyway, so you go through this endowment session, and that's where you enter into these blood oaths. So there's tokens, which are handshakes, and then there's signs, which are gesturing, you know, with your arms and stuff. And then there's penalties. Mm. So like you could do a gesture where your thumb was drawn across your stomach, and that would signify that your bowels would be cut and spilled out. <laughs> mm. Or you could do a gesture across your neck. That would show that you would be cut from, well, ear to ear. If you would ever divulge these sacred, anything of it, you know, the, either the penalties, okay. the signs, or the tokens. Hmm. And, you know, they have the same kind of gestures and whatnot in masonry, too. But I'm guessing that the Mormons don't include stomping on a Pope hat? No, no, no. So they didn't include wholesale everything, you know, and there was modifications, I'm sure. Okay, all right. So so how did this, uh, how did all this, this temple activity then trigger another shift then for you? So I mentioned that an endowment session has tokens, signs, and penalties, but I didn't really mention there's also a play that you go through. So there's actually actors, almost like a theater on a stage, and these actors are acting out a scene from the pre-existence, since they believe that we all pre-existed, right? <laughs> okay, the scene from our pre-existence. Yeah, basically we were all with God and Jesus in the pre-existence, okay? And Satan was there okay. and Satan fell and he took a third of the hosts of heaven with him. There's a theme and it's conveying ideas. And if you study Brigham Young and you know his theology, then you're aware that the theme pretty much is that, you know, if you're faithful to all these covenants, you'll get to actually enact all this out. You will be an Adam and Eve. So it starts out, there's a garden room and you actually change rooms. Like there's all these like theater seats, you know, and everybody sits in theater seats and mm -hmm. you can actually in the Salt Lake Temple still today watch a live session, but in virtually all the temples of the 250 some odd temples, they just have like movies, <laughs> 45 minute clips. Okay. The original live session though took like eight hours. 
to go through a session. <laughs> oh, wow. And you basically go through the first time for yourself. And every time you go through the temple and you do a session, you do it for somebody else. This was similar to being baptized for the dead. This was doing sessions for the dead. Well, baptism for the dead is kind of more like, what do they call that when they get a new drug out? Fast track. <laughs> mm. Baptism for the dead is like fast track, you know? I mean, they got like probably a dozen people being dunked. And so you'll kind of go through a loop and they'll baptize you and then you'll move on. And while you're, the dozen people are going around, they get a new name each time, see? So they go around. And it only takes like a few minutes. So you can baptize lots of people, you know? Okay. There's three kingdoms of glory where everybody ends up. And mm. this is all kind of reflected in the temple ceremony. So you, you start out and you're in the garden. And so the idea is that if you're faithful, you're going to be an Adam and an Eve. And you're going to start a world. And so you're going to be a God. Okay. Because Adam is God. See, so Adam, God, is really embedded into the temple ceremony. And so everybody picks up and moves to the next room. And you got all these beautiful paintings of the, you know, first the the garden room and then the telestial room. Okay? Okay. And then if you're faithful in the telestial room, then you get on to the celestial room. See, that's where you get to go. The celestial kingdom. Okay. Before you can go into the celestial kingdom, there's a veil. And behind the veil is the Holy of Holies, right? This is where God is supposed to dwell, right? Okay. You come to this veil, you actually do handshakes through little openings in this veil. And if you give the right ones, then you're admitted into the celestial kingdom. All right. So originally in Utah, when you got to that veil, there was a sermon at the veil. And that sermon was an Adam God explicit sermon, <laughs> but it was removed around the turn of the century. Hmm. And I knew it was removed. Having this background of old Mormonism, yeah. like I did, when I'm going through these steps, I'm like, this is Adam God. Whereas most people wouldn't even, they would never see it. They would never make the connection because they don't know the theology. So, I mean, not just that, but the blood oaths, which were also removed in uh, 1990, but I knew that they had been there. So I think what I, what's happening then is you're experiencing these aspects of Mormonism that you know aren't even accurate for what was supposed to have been. Right. I'm kind of putting this stuff on the shelf. It makes it want to come back off every time I go there. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I don't want to think about that, you know? I see. You didn't really want to deal with that, but... See no evil, hear no <laughs> evil. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to the temple and you're like, oh, here it is. All of this stuff that I have put behind me. Yeah, I've put behind me. And, and so there's like this pressure and I tried, okay, we're going to go every month, you know, but then I would go and probably the second time and I just like, ah, oh, I just don't want to go. You know? <laughs> mm. And plus, I never felt really good about, about any of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I kind of meant to say this about baptisms for the dead and temple work. When you're getting these deceased persons you know, the card that has their name on it, and you're going through the endowment session for them. And and by the way, I said it, it started out originally as eight hours, but now they got it down to 45 minutes. So you can do a lot more of them in your lifetime. <laughs> but I mean, when you're doing this, you know, it seems like there's some people in there that are just like, wow, this is just wonderful. I just feel the spirit and I, this feels great and everything, you know. Yeah. But while they were feeling great, or well, at least they seemed to be feeling great, they seemed to be feeling inspired. And I was feeling like, is this really saving these people? <laughs> you know, is this mm. really doing these people any good? Why can't God just save these people if he wants to save them? Why does he need me to do this for them? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm getting the uh, discomfort level that... Well, and I'm feeling like, is this really what God's, the holiness and, you know, God's temple, is, is this really true? Because this, this is not in the Bible, right? Yeah. And you can't help but think, did Joseph Smith make this up? <laughs> you know? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And then you want to believe it because you don't want to go against all your upbringing and everything, you know? You want to believe what you were taught. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just feeling... I call it a cookie cutter, you know, happy-go-lucky ice cream, apple pie Mormonism <laughs> where you just mm -hmm. do what you're told and you live a normal life and you just follow the prophet. And I guess I think the thing that the emptiness came from, it was just so cut and dry. And 
my commitment from the beginning, I mean, at least this is what I always told myself, was to the truth, period. Yeah, I signed up for it believing in good faith that this was the truth. But, you know, I kind of expected the results that you could expect <laughs> if you had and knew and practiced the truth. And I didn't feel like I was getting those results. Yeah. And so I just, it left me unsatisfied. Well, that puts you in an awkward place then, because you're completely embedded in this movement now. You know, um, the, the Mormon church says that they're neutral <laughs> politically. <laughs> That's what they claim. Mm. But, I mean, they only claim that when they have to claim it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, I, and I say that just looking back at the history, okay? Yeah. Like Brigham Young would have never claimed to be politically neutral. Okay. The first time they ever claimed to be politically neutral was when Utah became a state. And in order to become a state, they had to abandon polygamy. Yeah. I kind of questioned their neutrality, you know, even to the point of like, you know, doubting the leaders and people that claim to be prophets of God getting up and saying, hey, you know, we're the Church of Jesus Christ is politically neutral. It's like, where did you ever hear of a prophet in the Bible or any Mormon scripture that was politically neutral? It didn't make any sense, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, it seemed like to me that if God wanted to speak through Jeremiah or Isaiah or somebody, you know, he would just tell them what to say. And they didn't, they didn't like get all squeamish about giving a political view. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it didn't set well with me. And it didn't seem to me that that's a characteristic of God's true church. <laughs> This is like this continue, this growing list of things that were not easily reconciled. Yes, things that didn't add up. Part of the Articles of Faith is we believe in obeying and honoring and saying the law of the land. And we believe in being subject to kings and rulers. And Pretty much since the early 1900s, what they've been telling their members is that wherever country they're in, because it's a global church, you know, wherever you're at, you obey your leaders. So when the Hitler regime took power in Germany, they were told, obey your leaders. Mm. <laughs> so you had basically Mormons fighting for Hitler against Mormons fighting for the United States. And then there was actually, though, one young Mormon kid, 18 years old. He started listening to the BBC <laughs> in, his, in his grandmother's attic with this old radio that he found. And so he was hearing the British news, right? Mm -hmm. And then he came to the conclusion Hitler was doing all these terrible things. And so he decided he was going to expose him. And so he started writing all these tracts. And his local ward and bishop excommunicated him for not obeying and sustaining the leaders of the country. <laughs> uh. In the end, he was caught. And Hitler personally signed his death warrant. And he was beheaded. Wow. 18 years old, and he was the ringleader of a little trio he had. There was two other kids there, and he wouldn't give in. He's like, I'm going to die today because I stood for the truth. <laughs> and he just went to his death like, man, I mean, that was courage. Wow. The other two were like, oh, we're sorry, whatever. They, they got sent to work camps for the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So he, they were excommunicated, though, but in like the 1960s, after the information about Hitler came out, they were post, how do you say that? Post mortemously <laughs> rebaptized. Mm. And so they're now considered, you know, members in full faithful standing in heaven, of course. Naturally. Well, that's nice. I'm glad that they remedied that problem. But then in um, 2005, I think it was, there was an exhibit at BYU and they were honored. Look what these valiant Mormons did. You know, they stood up against Hitler. When the Mormons who were in Germany heard about this, they were just really upset. Like, we were doing what we were told by our leaders, you know? And these three were disobeying the leaders of the church. And now they're honored, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a contradiction. Yeah, like not inspiring great confidence in the organization to which you were affixed. No. And the funny thing is, like, they come out and they honor these three without even addressing, yeah, we know we were kind of flip-flopping. <laughs> you know, and most faithful members just see that and like, oh, yeah, they were wonderful. You know, and they don't even question. They don't. Even, it doesn't even occur to them. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> none of this occurs to them. <laughs> but it occurred to me. And it bothered me. Yeah. And so I began to be very doubtful. And I began to kind of reopen, reconsider Mormon fundamentalism. I went to 
a few other groups. I just kind of looked far and wide and I kind of became an independent, although my name was still on the records of the LDS church. And that went on pretty much from about 2008 until 2013. And then I also kind of heard about like, um, I mean, I heard about the feasts and the Torah movement. I began at that time to ask myself, did God really just abolish all the law, all the everything? And um, did he abolish Passover and tabernacles? Because they seem to be pretty significant. They seem to be almost kind of prophetic with the things I was learning about them. You know, I mean, Jesus was crucified on Passover, right? Mm-hmm. And there seems to be a lot of correlation with things that he said that connected with the feasts, you know, and it seems like understanding the feast gave you kind of a deeper understanding of a lot of things. Right. And and it's almost like the feast itself was kind of a foreshadowing and most people seem to be oblivious to that. And the LDS church, you didn't hear any of this. No, you? no, nothing. You know? Yeah. I just think, well, why would God, why would he abolish just such a perfectly wonderful feast day like Passover. <laughs> Why would you place Passover with Easter? I didn't feel like I got any good answers. Hmm. That's where I was. And and um, I pretty much got to the point where I lost all confidence in the LDS leadership. Yeah. But what were you then? <laughs> so I, be, I became kind of a, an independent Mormon, maybe even quasi-fundamentalist again. I just kind of revisited it and reconsidered. I thought, well, maybe maybe there's one of these little fundamentalist sects that's really the true, <laughs> the true schism, <laughs> mm. you know? Yeah. Maybe it's not my dad. Maybe it's another one. So you were exploring. I was exploring, and mm. I was actually exploring a little bit outside. I mean, I was fully willing to listen to a lot of broader Christian content and stuff, mm-hmm. and occasionally things would come up, and uh, and I would just wonder, is it possible the LDS, you know, the the restoration. <laughs> isn't even true at all. Mm. And I didn't like the thought, but I just, I was kind of grown up, you know, I was getting to be, oh, mid thirties. And I just thought, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you just have to grow up and, and be willing to accept the truth, no matter, no matter what it is, even if that means that Mormonism isn't true, mm. but it was very difficult. And it was a question that I sat on for, another five years. Yeah. You're in a limbo phase. And would you describe any of this stage, those last five years? Well, I spent five years just looking at everything rather than just looking in Mormonism. Okay. Just for the sake of clarity. Like, hey, look, if I look at this passage through Jehovah's Witness eyes or through Protestant eyes Mm -hmm. or through Mormon eyes or Catholic eyes, you know, what actually makes the most sense with the surrounding context of the passage? You know, not a crazy way to think. I began to kind of like do that about with everything. I kind of became a habit. Did it work? Yeah, it did because I was actually able to see outside my paradigm. Mm. I was able to actually consider possibilities that I never would have been able to consider. Mm. And I think honestly, this is one of the reasons why, you know, most people don't is because they only consider their own paradigm, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. And it's challenging too. Sure. You were kind of adrift during this period, and who wants to be that? I mean, no, I didn't. But um, so five years, I basically spent kind of on the fence with Mormonism, and really on the fence with the Torah. In my upbringing, my dad would talk about sin and how we ought not to sin and we ought to keep God's commandments. But as I began thinking about it through this new information, exactly what did they mean were the commandments? And what I found is that there's just at least in the Mormon backgrounds, is just kind of this confusion. You keep the commandments, you know, don't steal, don't kill, you know. Hmm. You can see, though, the New Testament, to me at least, it seems like it's drawing its authority on the law. Hmm. Like when Paul is talking against homosexuality, he's doing it on the basis of the law. So really, it still goes back to the law. I mean, how do we draw the line? How do we know what we're supposed to do? How do we know what sin is? It goes back to the same question. Hmm. For me, you know, I wasn't sure exactly about, you know, the sacrificial system. And I'm still not fully sure. But at least I, I can't see why God would do away with a law that says, for instance, if you see a nest in a tree, 
don't take the baby birds away from the mother bird. Can you see a reason why God would do away with that law? <laughs> do you think it's okay now to go and disturb nests and trees? I don't think you should. Yeah. And I don't see a reason why a law like that needs to be done away with. You know, and maybe there are some laws that you could say should be done away with. Because people would say, well, then we should go out and stone people, you know. I don't look at it that way. I think there's a difference between commandments and penalties. You know, if God decides to forgive King David because of his adultery and not have him stoned to death, this is kind of God's prerogative. But that doesn't mean that the commandment itself isn't a commandment. So in November of 2013, I decided that the Torah wasn't abolished. And at least what I mean by that is that we can't just ignore all these commandments and act like there's no relevance (laughs) at large, you know, to us. Mm. I mean, maybe they need to be understood in the context that we're living today. Okay. But one thing's for sure in my mind is that new Gentile converts coming into Christianity were exposed to the Torah with some kind of interactive response expected, hmm. maybe tailored to their situation. Okay. But anyway, so I came to believe that the Torah is relevant and it's not just irrelevant. So then I had to decide what that would mean for me as far as Mormonism goes. And in doing so, I tried to, I tried to fit Mormonism with the Torah. Is there a way you can make this work together? You know, maybe Joseph Smith didn't get around to just saying what God would have eventually told him. Maybe he died too early, or maybe he was, you know, heading that direction. (laughs) And in a nutshell, I came to some irreconcilable differences. One of them was on the requirements for a prophet. And that is in Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. Yeah. It says, if there arises among you a dreamer of dreams, you know, a prophet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he says, let us go after other gods, gods whom you have not known. You shall not hearken unto that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. And it goes on to say that that prophet shall be put to death because he sought to turn you out of the way which Yahweh, your God, commanded you to walk. Well, now I would say, well, definitely Joseph Smith did, in some sense, say, let's go after other gods. (laughs) Hmm. Of course, you know, in a certain sense, you could say the same thing about all Trinitarianism and oneness, (laughs) too, right? Yeah. But, I mean, Joseph Smith is a little unique, because he's claiming to be God's mouthpiece, his conduit. He's claiming revelation straight from God. Yeah. It's one thing to, to err in doctrine, you know, if you're sincerely wrong, but you're trying to do right and you're trying to teach right. It's another thing to err in doctrine if you're claiming to be the revelator for God. <laughs> yes. And especially if you're introducing a concept of like, hey, we're all going to become gods in the same sense that God is God. <laughs> You know? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't jive Joseph Smith with the Torah, according to Deuteronomy 13. Mm -hmm. It's not just that he taught against the law explicitly in the Book of Mormon, but it's that he came out with things explicitly contrary to the law. Because, so he was teaching polygamy. Excuse me, he didn't teach. He practiced. And we know he practiced it. But Mormon apologists are kind of in denial on it, but... (laughs) According to the law, how many witnesses do you need to verify a fact? Two. You only need two. And we've got more than two. We've got ample witnesses that verify that Joseph Smith was practicing a form of polyandry. He had sexual relations with other men's wives. I mean, if you if you believe that God's commandments aren't abolished, then... I mean, if they're abolished, you know, I mean, yeah, sure. You know, God can reveal something new. Polyandry is good, right? Mm. <laughs> so th- that was the dichotomy, right? I mean, if the law is done away with, it's, it can kind of get vague. I could not jive that among other teachings. I couldn't jive it. So have we achieved the moment of truth yet? 
No, we haven't yet. There's a couple more things. <laughs> All right. So I had been in a conversation with my sister. She had left, theologically at least, she'd left my dad. And she had kind of developed this belief that, well, Joseph Smith was a true prophet that wrote the Book of Mormon, but he fell. You know, he started doing things that were wrong. He came up with those things out of his own heart. He was kind of a fallen prophet, but he had been a true prophet. Hmm. So we were talking about one particular instance of Joseph Smith and this Heber C. Kimball, who was one of his 12 apostles. And he asked Heber C. Kimball for his wife, Valate, to be his wife. The story goes, Heber C. Kimball fasted and prayed for three days. And then in the end, he brought his wife, Valate, the, the love of his life, to Joseph Smith. And by the way, I mean, I'm not really doing justice to Heber C. Kimball. I mean, he had suffered greatly for his belief in Joseph Smith. Mm. He had been on missions for years and years and years. He'd been, so, he'd been away from his wife in England and all around the United States. Mm. And then on top of all that, then he's given this ultimatum. Oh. Well, he fasts and he prays. And then on the, on the third day, he brings his wife to Joseph to give her to him. And the story goes, you know, the more official story, that is, that Joseph, when he saw his devotion and his dedication, he broke down and he cried. He right then and there told Heber that he was just doing it for an Abrahamic test. Mm. <laughs> and he sealed them up for eternity. Heber and his wife, Valate. Well, that's kind of the official story. But what they don't usually talk about is that Heber actually offered his daughter to Joseph instead of his wife. <laughs> mm. And his daughter was 14. I mean, and that could be disturbing, rightfully. But what makes it even more disturbing is that his daughter, Helen Marr Kimball, she didn't want to. <laughs> She didn't want to be Joseph Smith's wife. Yeah. But um, Heber told her, you know that your father wouldn't ask you to do this if it wasn't right. And she said she had great respect. Now, I'm going off of what she said years later about her father. She said, yeah, she trusted her father and she loved her father. And then Heber had her go talk to Joseph. And Joseph said to her, he said, if you take this step, that it will guarantee, or words to that effect, the salvation of your father's whole house. Mm. And so my sister, I was very well aware of this story. I had heard it many times, and it bothered me, and it always bothered me. Yeah. But up to this point, I still hadn't given in the towel in spite of everything that I told you, really. And actually, the, the Deuteronomy 13 consideration kind of came about the same time. Okay? Okay. But anyway, so she said to me, she said, how could her accepting to marry Joseph Smith, how could that have guaranteed her father's household, their whole family's salvation? On, on what premise, on what principle of salvation do you know of anything in Scripture, Mormon or not, you know, could that even be right? Yeah. You know, and when she's, you know, sometimes when people like grab your head and they pinch your, your head between their hands and they make you look at something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That you really don't want to look at. I mean, she didn't do that literally, but I mean, that's kind of like, you know, here, no, look, focus, you know, think about this. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, there is no principle of righteousness or of the gospel or of anything that I understand the scriptures to teach that would ever even justify what he did. Right. There's nothing. And one night, um, my wife had gone. I was home alone. And I was just wrenching through this and just, um, and I remember a friend of mine who's now a Unitarian <laughs> and doesn't believe in Mormonism either. He called me at the time and he's like, how are you doing? I said, I'm not doing very good. I'm just like, I just don't know what to do with this. I, this 
can't be right. It just can't be. And um, I thought, he can't be God's prophet. He can't be a prophet of God. And I remember thinking, but I love Joseph Smith. I mean, he has such a beautiful story. If you've heard the story of the first vision, how he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's one of the most amazing, most beautiful stories I've ever heard in my life. And I had grown such an affinity, and I'd heard that story since I was young. But I love Joseph Smith. I, I want to believe that he's a prophet of God. I was very attached. So if I failed to express that before, I'm expressing it now. I was very attached. I want to believe. But then the thought came into my mind. Deuteronomy 13 isn't a suggestion. It's a commandment. You shall not hearken unto that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Period. And so for me, it was like there was a fork in the road. I could either follow Joseph Smith and Mormonism, but if I did so, I knew that I was going contrary to what had to be the truth. Again, you know, if the law is done away with, though, you can kind of squirm around that. (laughs) Yeah. And all of a sudden, when that full realization came to me, just this overwhelming feeling of sadness, I couldn't choose Joseph Smith. It was just tearing me apart. And the tears just started to flow like streams of tears down my eyes. And it was like I was saying goodbye. Goodbye forever. And just weeping. So the next day, I kind of wanted to dabble in it a little bit. If he was a bad apple, there had to be some sign of it at the very beginning. Hmm. I actually thought this, and I didn't even know what, what to look for. But I started browsing and, oh yeah, I'm going to go back and read his history. There was a time that he relates after his first vision where he started digging for money. He said he was hired by an old gentleman named Josiah Stoll and he was digging for a buried treasure, a Spanish mine. Everything that you could read in there would indicate that he was just digging with a shovel, just like everybody else. Okay. But I learned something that I did not know, and that is that he actually had a seer stone that he claimed was a seer stone that he had found when he was helping to dig a well. And he claimed to be able to find buried treasure and to be able to see its whereabouts by looking in this seer stone. What he was doing was not an uncommon thing. There were people around, locally around, that claimed to have this ability, and they were known as glass lookers. Hmm. So they would look and they would say, oh, the treasure is here. You know, we need to dig here. But what I did not know is that he had been hired out to use his seer stone and never found any treasure. There is no evidence that he had ever found any such thing. And if he had, I'm sure they would have listed it. Right, exactly. (laughs) People like Brigham Young would make the claim, oh, he could do this, he could do that. But there was never an account that said, yeah, he, well... I take that back. There was one account where some guy had lost something. (laughs) And he had actually said that Joseph had come into him and says, oh, I can help you find that. And he did help him find it. Hmm. The guy had come up 
with this item just missing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, okay. There was not a very good account where he had done this. Then I found an affidavit published in 1833 in a book with a bunch of other affidavits. But this affidavit, it was his father-in-law. In this affidavit, his father-in-law talked about how that he had met Joseph and that Joseph had asked for his daughter's hand in marriage and he said no because he didn't approve of what he was doing. And the clear implication of the words was that he believed that he was being a fraud. He was <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he was involved in fraudulent behavior. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm saying this with kind of a laugh now, but at the time, I just could not believe what I was reading. There was an affidavit by his father-in-law that, and that he actually was involved in this activity. Then I look at the history again. And I'm seeing what he's saying about Josiah Stoll. Oh, this old guy, he hired me, you know, to dig. You know, we, we were digging for, we're looking for buried treasure. And I mean, maybe he didn't say he was digging with a shovel, okay? But that's what you would think if you read the story. I realized that he intentionally had misled people in that account. Hmm. I mean, I guess the real shocker with this to me is that. I came to what I did the day before, and I had been around Mormon history all my life, and I had heard peripheral details, but for the first time, which was the very next day, I was piecing together that he had been involved in fraud from the very beginning. And there was actually an 1826 charge brought up against him. There were court documents that were found in the 1970s that I didn't know about. And that he had been on trial mm. for this very case, for the case of Josiah Stoll, because Josiah Stoll's nephew brought charges against Joseph Smith saying that he was taking advantage of his uncle because he didn't have this ability and he pretended and he was deceiving him and he was conning him. Mm. And I didn't know about that. You know, I just thought maybe maybe he just had this gift and maybe he could kind of see visions or something. You know, I didn't realize the context was fraudulent behavior. Huh. And anyway, so after he, he eloped with his wife, Emma, because her, her father wouldn't give permission, and in her, her father's affidavit, he goes on to say, I didn't approve of you marrying my daughter, and I don't approve of what you do for a living. Joseph, according to him, he said, Joseph said that he was not going to do glass looking anymore. Mm -hmm. that he was going to support his daughter and he was going to take care of her and, you know, get a real job kind of thing, you know? <laughs> okay. But then they went away back to New York. And then six months later, they came back. And to his astonishment, he claims to have in his possession gold plates <laughs> that he is supposed to translate by the gift and power of God and that the very instrument that he is using to translate them is the very thing that he had used to look for buried treasure. <laughs> mm. Oh, man. So I'm starting to realize all this, and I'm just shocked. And I just felt so stupid. How could I have been so dumb? How could I have been so gullible? I mean, I knew Mormon history. I read Mormon history. How could I have not seen this? Hmm. So I went to like heartbreak, the feeling of gullibility <laughs> and anger. Yeah, like the stages of grief. <laughs> yeah, kind of like an anger because, you know, you've been taken advantage of, lied to, and intentionally deceived by a con man. And that from hundreds of years past the fraud. Yeah, a couple of hundred years since, and his story is still leading people along the primrose path. Hmm. In the next few days, I found out more. And over the course of the next six months, I said to somebody, I found a hundred times more than I ever thought was out there. I mean, things that were completely, totally incriminating. And it was still three years from then before I even could understand and touch the issues of the Book of Mormon and the modalism. 
Yeah, the modalist doctrine taught in the Book of Mormon. So, I mean, so it just piled on. He was essentially paraphrasing like literature of the time, preachers of the day, itinerant camp meeting preachers in the revivalist movement, the Second Great Awakening. Yeah. And it's almost astonishing the stuff that I have found since then. Mm. <laughs> and then, like, probably the pinnacle of evidence for me more than anything, is just that no one could have a claim to the truth and have the revelations he did, identifying Jesus as God the Father directly. (laughs) And then later, of course, change it, you know, because, I mean, Mormons today don't believe Jesus is God as per se. They would not call Jesus God. Yeah. But they read passages in the Book of Mormon all the time that literally say those words. The Book of Mormon declares Jesus to be God Directly, it calls Jesus God. You think the Bible calls him God a lot? What what, what, what do we got? Maybe nine times? Maybe. You can probably narrow that down pretty easily to like three or four (laughs) and then maybe only two. The Book of Mormon directly and explicitly calls Jesus God some 700 and some odd times straight up. Wow. So there's a huge difference. It's just unbelievable, but... Mm. That's all part of our next conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe we'll get into pre-existence and different things too then, huh? Yeah, maybe we can do that. <laughs> the next time you hear Mike, it's not going to be his story. It's going to be about his discovery of the God of Jesus and what it meant. His insights will help us understand how Mormons might perceive and respond to what we're saying and how their beliefs on pre-existence impact their thinking. (laughs) If you have Mormons in your life, you'll appreciate that discussion. That said, I'm going to switch to some other content for a while and delay part four. I want to spend some extra time planning it out with Mike. A reminder that in March, there's a men's event in New York and a family event in Indiana. April has an Israel tour with Spirit and Truth, a woman's conference in New York, as well as a conference in Tennessee. Read more at unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. So, in an effort to hear from more people, I'm making a deliberate point to have a mailbag section near the end of each podcast. It's something I've basically been doing when there were emails to read or, yes, audio clips to play. So, it's really only a change in determination. I want to read your notes and your thoughts and your questions. Short questions I can answer during this segment. More involved questions may become entire episodes, as I have done in the past. Send your comments to podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. Fill my mailbag, and maybe I'll read your note here. Okay, regional UCA conferences. Well, it's a plan to have more gatherings in more places to connect more people. We on the UCA board are working out a model where a group could partner with us to host a regional UCA conference. We'd help promote the event and provide some resources. It's an opportunity to have an event that's better suited to your location and that is accessible to Unitarian Christians that are only maybe hours away. But also, it's a chance to highlight your group, introduce others to your ministry, and to do something new. It is significantly encouraging when you can connect your efforts with a part of a much larger movement. In a way, it could provide a bit of anti-stagnation medicine for your people, if that's something you would need. Like a weekend dose of, no, really, think bigger. (laughs) Keep your ears peeled for the official plan. If you know of someone who would find Mike's story helpful or fascinating, let them know. It's certainly unique. Now, I don't know whether it would be useful to hand to an active Mormon as a way to challenge them. It's not intended as an evangelistic conversion effort. It's a story that, by Mike's own admission, was told in a way that was meant for someone like you, someone who would understand and listen patiently without lashing out at his doctrines or or pushing him out the front door. It's a story intended for you. 
Coming up, we've got some non-Trinitarian Christian counselors. I'll talk about why the Trinity is so mainstream, as well as introduce you to another podcaster. Thank you, Mike. I know that this was a lot of recording and a lot of talking. I know that your lighthearted chuckles are only light in hindsight. I know it's part of your coping mechanism to help as you relive the frustrations and pain of having years of your life devoted to to one man's lie. So I appreciate your openness, and I believe you've helped a lot of people. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. <laughs>